well. So hello, everyone, and welcome back. We took a nice long summer break, and I hope you all had a great rest of your summer and introduction to fall. Welcome back to our AI in the Classroom series. <laughs> and of course, please do come off mute to chime in with your questions or your comments as we go. And of course, use the chat as much as you'd like as well. So in this session, we're gonna learn about a great model for introducing students to really big AI questions and kind of the fundamentals of AI. Joe Delfino is our guide for this discussion. He spent 19 years as a software engineer at Google, at CNN and at several tech startups before he shifted gears and decided to pursue a career in teaching. So he now teaches computational thinking at Beaver Country Day School in Brookline, Massachusetts. And Joe, I'll hand it over to you. Please take it away. All right, thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and pull our slides up for now. Um, as Jocelyn said, if you ever, at any point you have any questions or any thoughts, um, anything that you wanna share, please don't be afraid to jump in and interrupt me. Um, I have the slides up on my screen, so I might not see if you drop anything in the chat, but um, but Jocelyn will, will help out here. But um, yeah, the more discussion that we have today, the better, the better it will be. So please jump in um, if you have anything to add. Um, I'm gonna share some ideas uh, that we've tried out here at Beaver um, for introducing students to generative AI and, and AI concepts in general. Um, uh, you know, I, as Jocelyn said, I spent a long time as a software engineer, so I do, uh, you know, a fair know a fair bit about tech um, and machine learning and artificial intelligence. But I think, in terms of how to talk about these things to students and even other adults, um, I'm in the same boat as all of you. I'm still figuring it out. Uh, you know, we have some things that we tried that I'll share and share some some reflections on them. But um, I'm not necessarily the expert here. Uh, I'm just hoping hoping to foster some discussion and share some ideas. Um, so, whoops. So, uh, Jocelyn already gave a quick introduction. Um, I teach computational thinking at Beaver Country Day School in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts right now. Um, computational thinking is uh, it's sort of like computer science and then things around it. Uh, it's a, it's a um, problem solving uh, method uh, that involves, you know, potentially technology. Um, you know, and other structured ways to uh, attacking problems that make it possible to solve them with the help of computers. So I teach a coding class right now that focuses on creating visual um, uh, visual art with code. Um, next term here, I'll be teaching a data um, a class that I call Data is Beautiful, which is about data analysis and visualization. Um, uh, and I, I spend a lot of time collaborating with other um, teachers across the school and trying to find interesting ways to bring uh, computational thinking concepts into their disciplines in ways that make sense. So we don't try to shoehorn in, you know, uh, coding everywhere uh, for no particular reason. We try to find ways to um, bring these concepts in in ways that make sense uh, in a cross-disciplinary way. Um, so Beaver Country Day, it's an independent school for grades six through 12. Um, uh, we um, we really, really value deep learning here. Um, so, you know, we encourage, uh, we, we really try to focus on, um, you know, real world problems that are cross-disciplinary that encourage critical thinking. Um, and I won't spend too much time on that, but uh, we really do encourage students to, to really actively engage with their learning and, and take ownership of it. Um, the specific program that I'm going to talk about today, um, you can see our, our mascot dancing in the hallway here, our Beaver mascot, uh, is this program that we call Beaver 101. Uh, and this is something that we offer to all of our um, offer and require of all of our ninth graders um, that that come into the upper school here at Beaver, uh, and they do this during the first term. We run trimesters here, so it's about twelve weeks, uh, twelve or thirteen weeks at the beginning of their ninth grade year, uh, and they do a series of two week rotations uh, through through different workshops. Um, some of the workshops focus on, um, you know, they get to meet their counselors. Um, they might learn about opportunities for civic engagement. Uh, you know, we cover homework skills and study skills and other things like that. Um, and one of the rotations, the rotation that that I teach um, is focused on technology and research. And we spend three of the six days that we have this, with the students talking about AI and AI related topics. Um, and those days are each, they're 45 minutes long. 
Um, so this is, you know, it's about two and a half hours, uh, a little less than two and a half hours of time with the students to talk about this topic. So it's it's not very long. Um, uh, I forgot to mention during my introduction, I was supposed to be joined today by Sari Kelly Moody, who's who's our um, uh, librarian and educational technologist specialist here at Beaver. Unfortunately, something came up at the last minute uh, and she wasn't able to make it, which is unfortunate. She has a great, um, you know, perspective and additional thoughts to bring on this, but um, but we're missing her today. So um, I will try to fill in as best as I can for her perspective on this, but um, but I'm sure I won't won't do it justice because she's she's great. Um, uh, Sarah also teaches this uh, this workshop with me, so we we pair up on this to try to introduce um, AI and uh, some other concepts to the students. Um, so our big goal, you know, sort of the point that we started from when we when we were thinking about these these three days is if we can guide students to think of generative AI as a tool, um, help them understand its strengths and limits, and also help them identify the complex moral and ethical considerations related to its use, then we've we've done a good job. We'll consider that a, a success if we can meet that goal. Um, and so we broke that down into a few smaller, smaller goals. Um, we wanted at the end of it for students to be able to define at least a little bit what generative AI is. Um, as, as best as we can. Uh, we want them to have some understanding for how AI is trained. Where do AI models come from? What, what, <laughs> where do they come from? How do they, how do they get all this knowledge that they seem to have? Um, uh, we want them to be able to discuss potential benefits and harms of using it. It's not all good. It's not all bad. Um, uh, and we want them to, to be able to take a critical, critical look at, uh, um, generative AI and AI in general, and be able to just to think and talk about um, uh, how it can be beneficial or not. And we wanna get them some experience actually using ChatGPT as a way to um, you know, make it potentially specifically useful to them. Um, you know, Beaver as a school uh, has you know, mostly embraced the generative AI tools and we, we wanna teach students how to use them responsibly. Um, uh, so, this is, you know, this this course offers a little bit of an introduction to how to use tools like that um, in a way that's helpful to their learning experience and and in their classes. Um, so just to touch on the reality of these classes, like I mentioned, these are they're 40, 45 minute classes at at best. Um, they're right before lunch after a morning, long morning of classes. Um, uh, this is time that that upper school students have free during the during the lunch break um and so there's a little bit of jealousy there um and so so there's a wide range of sort of uh, levels of excitement um and, and engagement that we get from the ninth graders during this time um some of them actually come in really excited to talk about ai and related things and others um would just really rather be at lunch um and so you know we, we've we've had to work really hard on keeping the content engaging and keeping it um you know um, just like you always want to do, but but I think especially uh, in this setting, um, you know, something that they can connect with and, and get excited about. Um, so our approach to this um, has been launch, test, refine. Uh, um, th this is actually a pretty interesting opportunity here because we we do the same workshop five times in a row with the with as the students rotate through in different groups. Um, so it's actually a really interesting place to be able to try out some ideas on the first couple um, uh, versions of this and then adjust really quickly and then uh, you know take the things that worked, cut out the things that didn't work that well uh, and see how they work with the with the next group. Um, so I'm gonna walk through uh, a little bit of the evolution of what we tried to talk about maybe some of the things that didn't work um, and then come back to what we're doing right now, which is hopefully a collection of things that work better than what we started with, um, but but can always still use improvement. Um, so here's our, uh, an, uh, an outline of our three, the three days that we started with. So, um, on day one for the first 45 minutes or so, uh, we spent some time with some discussion prompts. So we talked, uh, we spent some time trying to define AI and generative AI and, uh, get, get the students to talk about what those things were, what is AI, what's not AI, what qualifies. Um, and then we also walked them through some discussion prompts, uh, around specific scenarios uh, to think through benefits and harms of potential benefits and harms of AI. So one of the examples that we gave was um, uh, Twitch, which is a streaming 
video platform uh, often used for, by like e-gamers uh, to, to stream their games. Um, and they have uh, automated systems that detect uh, abuse in the chat. So um, when member when when uh, members of the chat are acting in, abuse, in an abusive manner and they get kicked out of the chat, often they'll just sign up immediately under a new email address and come right back in and start the same behavior up again. And so Twitch has uh, they built these AI systems that try to automatically identify this this behavior um, and auto ban users. And so we get student we try to get students talking about um, you know is this good is this bad are there potential you know how can this go wrong um, is it overall more helpful than it is harmful. Um, the other prompt that we gave them was around voice banking, where you can collect um, uh, some relatively small amount of recording of a person's voice, only a few minutes, uh, and then be able to recreate um, virtually any speech uh, that sounds like the person. Um, and so um, this one, there's there's maybe some more nuance to this one than the the, the Twitch troll detection algorithm. Um, you know, there's some interesting potential benefits to this. Uh, but there are also some really interesting potential harms around fraud and things like that. And so trying to get the students into discussing um, some of those uh, some of those trade-offs and and talking about, um, you know, do the benefits here out, outweigh the harms? Uh, and then we close that day by watching a couple of videos on bias um, uh, in machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. One uh, I can't recommend highly enough is uh, a, a video on um, a paper called Gender Shades. It's by Joy. Uh, Bulamwini, uh, who's a researcher out of MIT, uh, and she talks about um, how facial recognition algorithms um, are biased against people with darker skin uh, and biased against um, people that uh, appear as uh, the sort of the, the stereotype of a, of a female. Um, and uh, she did research into why this happened and and um, how different systems handle this and talks about the bias that is encoded in a lot of these algorithms um, in a really, uh, you know, intelligent, ac accessible way. Um, uh, the other video that we watched there was a short from the um, uh, the RSA, the Royal Society, um, the Encouragement of Arts and uh, Sciences, I believe, um, that talks about how an algorithm uh, is just an opinion embedded in math, which is a great um, a great phrase that I love. And that one tries to get the point across that um, just because we're talking about a computer or an algorithm, uh, it doesn't mean that it's somehow unbiased or uh, objective fact. Um, these are systems that are built by people. Um, they're tested by people. They're validated by people. And people bring all of their biases into building those systems. And so um, uh, you know, the video sort of gets at that point through um, an interesting example of a, um, a parent who's cooking dinner uh, for their children, and they apply an algorithm to this. And the inputs to the algorithm are what food they have in their pantry uh, and and how past dinners have gone over. Um, and their metric for success is how many vegetables that their kids eat. And they talk a little bit about how if their kids got to define the metrics of success from that algorithm, uh, how the outcome might be different and how what you learn over time about which dinners were successful and not might be different um, depending on the metrics that you that you pick um, and how there's an element of power there in, in um, you know, the creators of those algorithms and the, the measures of those algorithms to define what successful means. Um, so that's what we did on day one. Uh, day two, we used this really cool tool called Teachable Machine. Um, and I'm gonna give a quick uh, demo of Teachable Machine here. So this is a web app that anybody can, can access um, that lets you train your own machine learning model. And I'll give a quick example of this. So you can come in, here and I can capture images with my webcam of my face. So I hold the button down and it captures a bunch of images. I give it some different angles. Um, I will name this, this one me. And then I can also capture some images of my water bottle, maybe at different angles, we'll get the bottom. And then you can click this button in the middle here that says train model and it will take a few seconds it will train a model for us. And then we can test the model. So we can see over here um, that when my face is in the, the picture, it's it's very sure that this is me. It recognizes that my head is in the picture. Um, if I show it my water bottle, it becomes 
pretty sure that uh, that's my water bottle there. You can see it's saying 100% on class two at the bottom. When I face it back towards me, it says 100% me. Um, if I bring both things into the picture at once, it's a little less, you know, the confidence sort of wavers depending on things. Um, interestingly, if if we get me, uh, it's not going to show it here. The, it's a little bit dependent on the background. So you can sort of see it. Its confidence is dipping a little bit there. Um, because the background behind me is busier uh, and a little bit more similar to how, to what was in the background when I trained it on my water bottle. Um, and so this is a tool that we show to the students um, and then we let them play around with it. Um, so we, we show them an example. The first example we show is uh, something very similar to this where we'll, have, we'll train it on two different faces. So we would train it on my face um, and maybe train it on Sarah's face. Um, and we would do it with two different backgrounds behind us, or maybe one of us with a mask on and the other with without a mask on. Um, and then we would show that, you know, it's able to recognize me, it's able to recognize Sarah. Um, but what happens if one of us puts the mask on and the other one takes it off? Um, and you can show the model getting a little bit confused. Um, so I'm going to switch back to my slides while I talk about this. Um, and, and then we ask the students to play around with it. Uh, we 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 pair them up and we have them jump in and we ask them to train their own model um, uh, on something other than their faces. We you know we recommend that maybe they draw some doodles on the whiteboards or um, you can upload images that you find from the internet. Um, and we leave it pretty wide open. We just say teach it to differentiate between at least two different things, and we let them we let them go on it. And then we bring them back and we have them discuss uh, how it worked for them. Um, and invariably, there's always at least one group where. They weren't really able to get it to work. They tried something and their model couldn't recognize the difference between them. Um, uh, and we talk about why, and we talk about some ideas for why, like what what did you, what training data did you give to the model? What did you put into the model? Um, and why, how could that explain the results that you're getting out? Um, and so we we hit on that concept, you know, several times throughout the, the demo, the initial demo of Teachable Machine and through this discussion on this concept of, if you put garbage in to these models, you're going to get garbage out. Um, and you know, you get out what you put in. And um, actually playing around with it and trying to get their own model to work, I think really, really drives that point home for the kids and gets them, um, you know, shows them a real concrete example of that. Um, and then we usually end uh, this day by showing uh, one last example uh, that ties back to bias where we, um, I have a pre-selected set of images of cats and dogs that I load in um, to train a, a classifier that can tell the difference between pictures of cats and dogs. And the training set is sort of subtly biased towards cats. So it's better at recognizing cats than it is at recognizing dogs. Uh, and then we show it some, we test it with some pictures of cats and dogs. And, and you can see um, through the demo that it is able to identify all the cats, but it fails on some of the dogs. Um, and so we talk about how this is a little bit silly with cats and dogs, but if you think about this in the context of a facial recognition system that's used by law enforcement and border control, um, it becomes a lot more serious and a lot more important to think about, um, you know, how are you validating that the data that you're training with um, and that the way that you're testing the model at the end to determine whether it's doing what you expect it to, to do, um, why that's important um, and how we don't always see that in the systems that are out there that are out there today. Um, so Teachable Machine is great. I highly recommend uh, checking it out and trying it out um, with your students. They love they love playing around with it. Um, day three is, uh, we talk about chat GPT specifically. Um, uh, we, I start off the class by asking, I pull, I just pull up chat GPT. I take a quick poll, you know, who has used this before? Um, and I was actually surprised starting this year, I was expecting everybody to have used it or virtually everybody to have used it. Um, but it's actually more split than that. There, there are a number who haven't used it or, um, or at least claim to have not used any tools similar to it. Uh, apparently Snapchat has a Snapchat AI. Uh, um, so like a similar type of large language model bot that's embedded in Snapchat that a lot of them have used um, that comes up sometimes. But but some of them haven't really messed around with any of these, these systems yet. So I give a quick demo um, and I start off by asking it to just to write, uh, you, you know, the prompt that I give is something along the lines of, I'm teaching a workshop. Uh, on on AI, it's 45 minutes long. I'm teaching it to ninth graders. Uh, they're all hungry and grumpy, uh, and they just want to go to lunch. Um, please write a motiv short motivational speech to get them excited about the topic. Uh, and ChatGPT will it'll spit out something, and I'll read it verbatim. 
Um, and it always sounds, uh, you know, it always sounds terrible. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's stilted. Uh, it's got a, it's got a distinct, like, Hey, Hey there, fellow kids vibe. Um, and that the kids, you know, they, 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 um, usually they get a kick out of it and they think it's funny and it gets them kind of laughing and at least, at least engaged. Um, and then from there, I go on to show a couple other examples of things that they might not, uh, realize that you can ask tools like this to do. Like I give it, um, uh, I showed an example, them example of asking ChatGPT to create a lunch menu for my kids. Uh, I, have, I have a six and eight year old. I have to pack them lunch every day uh, and they go to a nut-free school. And so I asked ChatGPT to create a menu, a nut-free menu for them. And it spits out, here's Monday through Sunday. Um, here are lunches that you can pack for your kids. Uh, and then one of the lunches in there is tomato soup, which would be a disaster if I sent it to the school with my kids, they would come home just covered in red. Um, and uh, so I ask it to amend the menu and leave out the soup and don't do the weekends and it gives me a new one. And then I ask it to create a, a shopping list for the menu and it, it comes back with a shopping list for the things that I need to buy at the store. And then I ask it to create a meal prep plan for that menu and it tells me what I should do on each day to prepare to prepare the meals. Um, and so this gives them an idea that you can really have a dialogue with ChatGPT. It's not just a question and answer uh, uh, engine. You can come in and have a conversation with it, ask it to refine, ask it to go deeper. Uh, the other example I show them is to ask it to write a table of contents for a book about a topic that you're interested in. Um, and it will it will happily spit out a, um, a table of contents that gives a really nice breakdown of the different areas uh, involved in that topic. Um, and so if you don't know anything about a topic, this is a great way to get an overview of what you might wanna dig into or what you might wanna learn if you're learning about this topic. Uh, and then you can ask it to expand on any of the chapters and tell you more about that. Uh, and so it, that that usually clicks home for them as like, hey, I could I could use this um, to help with research. I can't, um, you know, we also talk about, I point out that at the bottom of the screen on ChatGPT, it says, you can't trust ChatGPT uh, uh, when it says anything about people, places, or facts. Um, and so we we talk about that a little bit too. And then I show them an example um, of having ChatGPT produce just completely bogus information. Um, you can ask it to summarize a book, uh, and then you can ask it um, what the meaning of, of a completely made up scene in that book was. Um, so uh, um, I usually pick a book that they've read that 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 I know that most of them have read um, in one of their classes. And then I ask it about a scene that did not happen in that book. And often it will spit out a deep analysis of what that scene meant in that book, um, even though it doesn't, doesn't exist at all. Um, and so that really drives home the point of like, okay, you have to validate what this thing is giving back to you. You can't just trust it. It's not, it's not a, um, it's not a trusted source. It's, it's maybe an interesting tool. Um, we also, uh, sometimes we, we look at uh, some additional examples there from a New York Times article uh, where um, they asked uh, ChatGPT and BARD uh, and I think one other large language model to generate answers to college essay um, admission admission essay prompts. Um, and the first one they ask it is to uh, is to write a um, uh, pick a song that would be the soundtrack of your life uh, and talk about why. Uh, and the song that it picks is Cake by the Ocean. Um, which, uh, for anybody not familiar with that song, um, it's it's um, it's actually it's the title of the song is "Cake Cake by the Ocean," but it's actually about sex on the beach. Um, every ninth grader at, at my school, at least, knows this uh, and thinks this is hilarious. Um, uh, and again, sort of drives point home the point that you can't always really trust what this thing is coming up with. Um, there's another one where you can ask it without any detail to write a paragraph. Um, uh, that you would give to your future roommates in college, uh, telling them something about yourself. And ChatGPT, again, will happily generate this paragraph talking about how you're creative and you're a bookworm and, and all these other things about yourself, um, but you haven't told it anything. And so it's just fabricated something. Uh, so we run through some some set of these examples. We we don't ever get through all of these in any, any given session, um, but really trying to show them through examples that they connect with somehow that uh, this thing isn't infallible, infallible, it doesn't know everything, but it can be really useful. And then we ask them, uh, we give them some, some sort of essential questions uh, around AI, uh, and we, we group them up, um, questions along the lines of, you know, how should students at Beaver be able to use generative AI? How should teachers at Beaver be able to use generative AI? Should they be able to use it to make lesson plans? Should they be able to use it to write feedback for students? Um, that one always grabs their attention because the idea of 
teachers getting to use this tool uh, to some of them is deeply, deeply offensive. Um, uh, uh, and then we, you know, we push them to get beyond that a little bit and think about like, well, well, why are there situations where it is okay or isn't okay? Um, we, we asked them about uh, whether everybody should have access to facial, powerful fa facial recognition systems. We asked them about uh, intellectual property rights um, for the image generation tools like Dolly, um, where you can type in a prompt and have it generate an image for you. They're often trained on uh, images from artists that have not explicitly consented, or in some cases have even explicitly not consented to having their work used in this way. Um, is that okay? If you were an artist, would you allow your work to be included in a, in a model like this? Um, so we asked them to take these questions, discuss them a little bit, and then use ChatGPT to write a short speech that they have to give to the class representing their position on the topic. Um, and we try to structure this activity a little bit and you know, before we let them get their laptops out to play around with ChatGPT, we force them to discuss with each other a little bit um, and to take a position on the answer that they want to give. So that when they start with ChatGPT, they're not just typing in the question that we gave them and having ChatGPT supply whatever answer it thinks. We're trying to get them to put in their opinion or their thoughts on the, the topic and have ChatGPT actually generate the text of the speech that they can give. Um, and then we also encourage them to have a little fun with it. You can ask it to write the speech in different voices. Um, and you know, so some of them write it like a Simpsons character. I had one group write it um, uh, in the voice of a kindergartner. Um, and so they get up in front of the, the class and they read the speech and everybody laughs. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a good way to get them playing around with it uh, in a little bit of a structured way. Um, I've been talking a lot really fast. Um, the next things that I'm gonna talk about are uh, some of the things that we learned from this rotation uh, and, and sort of where we ended up, which is not hugely different from where we started, but there are a couple tweaks. Um, before that, I do want to just pause from my stream of words. Are there any questions or any thoughts that people want to jump in with now? Do we have anything in the chat uh, that we want to share? Oh, yeah, somebody posted a link to the RSA video. Thank you. That's a great one. All right, um, I will keep going, but please don't be afraid to interrupt, um, jump in. Um, so some of the takeaways that we had from this, uh, from the first round or so of this, um, on day one, defining AI is not likely to be engaging for ninth graders. Uh, um, they, to them, it's it's a little bit silly. Um, and even to me, I find this exercise a little bit arbitrary, like what is AI and what is not? Where do you draw the line? Um, I know. For myself personally, I tend to draw the line at um, uh, something counts as AI if it uh, if the complexity of the system has gone gone beyond the point um, where a human can predict what sort of response it'll give for a particular input. Um, but there there are sort of different points on the continuum of smart computers that you can pick to draw the line for AI or not AI. Um, but we found that this the discussion of that nuance, um, at least in this particular context was lost, um, wasn't, didn't, didn't engage the students. Um, and so we mostly dropped that, uh, that part of the exercise from the rotation. Um, and we, we start off by talking, just giving a quick definition of, you know, AI, um, you know, what is AI in general? What is generative AI? Because we're going to be talking a lot about that. So generative AI is, um, AI that can seemingly, or at least my definition for it is, uh, AI that can, um, seemingly create novel, um, ideas or responses, um, uh, in response to some prompt. Um, I'll also say that, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise to me or, or anybody really, but the idea of smart computers, uh, it blows my mind still. Um, it doesn't really blow most of their minds. Um, this is just kind of normal for them. Uh, and I don't think they, um, uh, you know, I don't, I think a lot of them don't really realize how transformative, uh, the last few years and probably the next few years are, are going to be yet. Um, and uh, getting getting that across, um, you know, in the space of a fifteen minute discussion um, in this context for us, I think wasn't didn't didn't seem like likely to work. Uh, so we, um, you know, we really de-emphasized that part of it. Um, on day two, like I said, they love playing with Teachable Machine. Um, uh, it, it does seem like some ideas about model training and the idea that what you put in is what you get out does really stick with them. Um, when I go through that demo. Um, on bias where I load up the cat and dog data. And, um, you know, my first question after I show how it doesn't perform well in identifying dogs is, what do you think is wrong here? How could we fix this? 
Um, and there's always a bunch of hands that go up. There's always a bunch of ideas. There are more pictures of cats than dogs. There's more variation in the poses of the cats in the pictures than there are in dogs. Or there's there's this color versus not that color or all these other ideas. So they they kind of, you know, they're, they're getting the idea that that we feed in training data and that determines how the model, um, how the model performs after that. Um, so, so that, that part, uh, felt really successful and we've, we've mostly kept that unchanged. Um, for day three, there's a surprisingly wide range of interest in chat GPT. This is another thing I went in sort of expecting that everybody would be like really excited to talk about chat GPT and play with it. Um, and some of them are, some of them think it's really neat and, and love to play around with it. And others are just like, yeah, I don't, whatever. It's just another thing, just another thing on the internet out there. Um, uh, I will say that one thing that does sort of universally grab them is, is again, the idea of teachers using ChatGPT in their practice. Um, uh, you know, that, that tends to get them to perk up a little bit and say, wait, what, uh, let's talk about this one. I, I want to be able to use it however I want, but teachers shouldn't, shouldn't be able to use it however they want. And so that, that's, that's often a good in to just get them talking about the, the ideas and the concept. Um, so, um, you know, and again, uh, the, the only other point to touch on here that I didn't already already talk about is to, you know, we we continue, we, we started off with this, but we continue to really lean heavily on examples that ninth graders have some direct connection to, um, you know, at, at uh, um, I'll talk, I'll jump ahead to the next slide. Um, on, on day two, uh, we switched the order around a little bit. Um, we pulled Teachable Machine up to day one. Um, we, we, we do the training bias demo at the end of that, that day with, with teachable machine. And um, then we start out day two with those videos on bias and discuss a little bit like, okay, how does this connect to what we were doing yesterday with teachable machine and talk through some of the issues there. Um, and then we do a little bit of, um, we do some case studies on bias and ethics and machine learning. So we take a look at, uh, some articles, uh, we, we basically distribute around some articles on different ways that machine learning has gone wrong. Um, and you know, this is a case where we've had different levels of success with the different stories that we've picked here. Um, and the original batch that we picked had one story about um, how minority groups tend to get higher mortgage rates or get denied more often um, for mortgages um, in systems, uh, for, you know, with companies that use AI to help them make those decisions. Uh, and you know, I guess unsurprisingly, in retrospect, the ninth graders didn't really connect with that. Some of them don't even know what a mortgage is. Uh, so we explained that, but not, most of them are not really thinking about taking loans out to buy houses. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of them did really connect to a story about um, a, an experiment that Facebook ran a number of years back called the Facebook happiness experiment, where they, they actually manipulated uh, people's news feeds to show either, either more or uh, happier, sort of happier or sadder stories in your news feeds and then tried to measure the impact of that on people's moods by looking at what they then posted on their um on their feeds and um, they did this without any consent or uh or or notice to the users that they were doing it to and then it eventually came out um and people were rightly you know kind of horrified and outraged at the fact that facebook was trying to manipulate their emotions to see i don't know to learn something um that one grabs them because they they browse their feeds all day long. Um, and so the idea that there's some company out there sort of trying to manipulate them through those feeds uh, is interesting to them. Um, and then that also leads into an interesting discussion around even outside of that experiment, um, the companies are, are still using those feeds to manipulate you, just maybe not uh, in, in quite as an experimental way as, as what they did there. So, um, uh, you know, just finding those, those topics that tend to really uh, resonate with them and that they connect with in their daily lives. Um, and then day three, day three has worked pretty well. We've mostly kept day three uh, the same, talking about ChatGPT, getting them some experience using it. Hopefully they can bring uh, some of that perspective into their other classes. Um, different classes here and different teachers um, approach ChatGPT differently. Um, some, you know, some teachers are, uh, have really embraced it and actively teach how to use it and incorporate it into their assignments. Other teachers are a little bit more hands off around it where it's just, you know, let me know if you're using this or, you know, just, just, um, try to, uh, not necessarily cite it because it's not necessarily a citable source. Um, but at least, you know, disclose that you've used it. Um, you know, and then other teachers or for certain assignments, uh, ask students not to use it, um, depending on, you know, what the learning goal of the, the assignment is. Um, 
but we're hoping that you know when they do encounter in their other classes they at least have some sense of what its strengths and weaknesses are and what you how you have to um um uh different ways that you can interact with it to get good answers out um so yeah just to just to wrap up now um what we want students to think about after this uh generative ai is a tool um this is uh this is how i think of it um this is how you know i would say that uh, overall beaver as a school tries to think about it um their their generative ai is not going away um trying to to ban its use or prevent students from using it um is uh not going to be effective in the end because they'll find the ways around it um uh, but it's also in some ways I, I think a little bit of a disservice to them because um you know even coming from the software industry uh even a few years ago and i know it's exploded since then software developers use these tools in their their day-to-day -day jobs i know that other people use these tools in their day-to-day -to -day jobs um they are useful tools they do have their limits um but pretending that they aren't there uh uh in, in all contexts um I think does a little bit of a disservice um, and, and it, and it comes across as disingenuous to the students too. They, they realize that these things are being used out there. Um, now that doesn't say that they should always be able to use them everywhere. And that's, that's also not the stance that we take. There are times where students have to demonstrate that their own brains have learned things. Um, and we do still ask them to do that. Um, but, but to be thinking about the, these things as a tool um, and not as oracles that know everything um, and also not as sort of forbidden, um, you know, forbidden things that they, they should never use. Um, we also really, you know, we try to weave through the entire week, uh, this thread that no system that humans have built is free of bias. You need to be aware of that. Uh, you need to be thoughtful and critical, uh, think critically about the systems that you're interacting with, um, and what kind of bias they might have and what, um, how that might impact you or other people. Um, uh, even as a user of those systems, um, if you ever go down the road of trying to create systems, uh, like this, it's even more important to think about, um, uh, you know, really think deeply about those topics. Uh, so we want to, you know, at least plant the seeds around that with students. Um, and then the last one, you know, again, a thread that we try to weave through everything is what you put in influences what you get out. Um, uh, if you if you put garbage into these models, you will get garbage out. Um, if you put garbage into your prompts, you will get garbage out. Um, and so you have to be uh, thoughtful about, about those things. Um, so, uh, I'd love to have a little bit of discussion here if anybody has questions or thoughts they want to share. Um, and then uh, depending on, I think we're, we've got a little bit of time. We might have time to do some breakout groups with smaller groups to just discuss uh, either these questions that I have on the screen or anything else that's on your mind. Um, but does anybody want to jump in right now with thoughts or questions or anything? I'll jump in. Um... Hey, thanks for um, a really wonderful presentation. This is a great framework. I, I love how you refined the uh, the sequence after the three days. Um, I I am um, worried about a couple of things. Um, when I you know we we um, I coordinated a media literacy program in Brazil and we're developing our own generative AI curriculum and so on. But I worry a little bit that we're kind of jumping over just basic algorithmic literacy. And I am wondering uh, where that fits into your thoughts and, and your sequences, because um, we do have some things that are very worrying to me happening. Like for example, a generative AI and search converging, starting to converge. Um, I don't know if you've seen the last, the latest promos from Google around um, image uh, generation built into the um, search engine. So now you can search for something that doesn't exist and it kind of confuses the meaning to me a lot. Um, and also because we're in Brazil and we're, you know, we're very aware of things like the digital divide. So it's really wonderful if you have kids that have access to computers and, and um, can play with chat GPT. But um, I also feel that things like algorithmic literacy and uh, generative AI uh, use or, uh, or the lack of are broadening the digital divide not only locally, but also on a global level. And people that are most impacted, that are disproportionately impacted by, by um, these things are the people that have less, less access to um, training. 
So things like algorithmic bias and prediction and recommendation systems that lead to echo chambers and AI generated disinformation and propaganda are gonna hit hardest among populations that have less algorithmic literacy and less exposure to these kinds of training. So I'm just wondering if that's, you know, just general algorithmic literacy and those kinds of questions are in your radar somehow. Yeah, I mean, we, um, I mean, those are, those are all great points and thank you, thank you for raising them. Um, you know, I, I think we do touch a little bit on some of them. We don't spend enough time and we, we don't have, you know, there's only, this is only a, you know, two, two hours and 15 minutes or, or so. Yeah. Um, Can I have your bowl to start a lot, the dishwash? Oops. <laughs> um, so, so it is short. We do try, when we talk about bias, um, we, we do try to touch on, uh, you know, we really try to focus on how these systems impact people um, and, and some of the ways that, that, that they can harm people um, if, if, and when they're, they're misused. Um, but I think in terms, you know, right now we are not doing a good job uh, through this of addressing that, that lar the larger topic that you're talking about around um, algorithmic literacy and, um, yeah, I would love to hear if anybody else has thoughts or things they've tried with with trying to get at those topics. Or if you, or um, Mariana, if you have have any thoughts, I would love to hear them. Working on it, doing some research on it. <laughs> I have more of a question just around um, the idea going back to the algorithmic literacy. Which, thank you, Mariana. I like it. That just like kind of popped my brain. Um, but like, we have a school district who as soon as you know, chat GPT was kind of like the hot thing, instantly said, you know, we're not no one can use it. Like, it's just AI is out of the out of the question, right. So uh, yet we have leadership who's like encouraging us to use it yet our IT department saying no one has access to it. So from a school district standpoint, like, how did you did you have any pushback from schools? I'm I'm guessing you, your district you did not. Um, and do you have any words of I guess maybe recommendation to get around that? Um, so we, we didn't hear. Uh, you know, Be Beaver is an independent school, and um, you know we're we're pretty progressive, and so I think our initial response to it was uh, you know, pretty immediately like, okay, this you know this is obviously here to stay. Um, you know, we should figure out how to how to embrace it and incorporate it into the into our practice. Um, and so that so um, I know that's unusual. Um, I, I think that's I think that's unusual and sort of the exception rather than the rule. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any personal experience in sort of fighting that battle, uh, you know, with with districts. Has anybody else? I mean, I would say that, my, you know, if, if I were in that position, and I'm sure these are already, you know, things that you're considering, but, um, you know, I would, I would probably pull examples of, of ways that this is used in industries and in, in real jobs and ways that it's helpful and just point out that, um, you know, to prepare students to enter this world, uh, teaching them how to use these tools and, and, uh, when to use them and when not to use them, uh, you, you, the only way to teach them that is to, is to is to teach it to them, to be able to to show it to them and have them try it out and experiment with it. Um, and just just banning them is going to leave them unprepared to enter a world that that is embracing them and is using them for better or worse. No, absolutely, and that's why I try to explain, like you know, this, like you said, that this isn't going away. And if we don't start embracing it, it's a uh, <laughs> you know, we're only hurting our students versus helping them to be prepared and to use it in an ethical manner and to really understand the benefits and the cons around it as well. So thank you. Um, I had a question. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, so I, I had a question, which I, I think it's also kind of in the um, popped up in the chat there too, which is thinking about um, since you have a more embracing uh, attitude at your school, but this is for the ninth graders, right? Um, and it's new enough that your older students haven't gotten through, you know, like they didn't get it through ninth grade, presumably, um, is are there ways that you're able to hit that hit that student population um, in other places? Because we, we have, um, 
a we have ninth grade studies which sounds very similar to this class um and they're they have consistently not like allowed any room for library and like literacy related stuff in there because they're teaching like all the things like <laughs> to the ninth graders from like study skills to sex ed to like everything else um and so but our our older students are the ones who I think are struggling more with like where how to how to use it and when maybe be ready to really think more deeply about some of these issues that you brought up so I guess I'm just wondering are there are there ways that you found um, to get that in for older students? Um, some things that we've tried here uh, are, um, I know that in some departments, I think in the history department, um, and I'm not sure about English, um, they, they have gotten together to talk about, uh, you know, sort of ways to to roll it out across either a grade level or, you know, across, across every class in the department. Um, you know, where maybe everybody will kind of team up to, to incorporate it into a unit um, and, and devote some time to talking about, okay, what is this tool? How do we use it? How does it make sense in the context of this, um, you know, this topic that we're talking about? Uh, so, so that's one way that can potentially hit um, uh, a wide range of students. Um, beyond that, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I don't have a great answer. Um, you know, we don't, there's not really time in our schedule same thing for for you know anybody even even in ninth grade getting this time I think is is um a little bit exceptional um but for the for the later grades there's just no way for us to get uh to get time across every student um and so be, then then it becomes more piecemeal uh you know which also becomes an equity concern where you know maybe we're in some classes uh covering these things and pairing up with some teachers but not in others um uh and and yeah equity equity definitely is a, an issue then I think uh, if I may just add to that, I, I think that there's a real argument here um, in favor of looking at this as part of media and information literacy, uh, and therefore not just as something that points to skills for a future job market or, or for people that are interested in computer science alone, but it's also part of uh, accessing information and sustaining democracy. And we've been trying uh, to argue that way. Um, because there's a real resistance and, and there is resistance in terms of both there's no space, um, you know, there's no time in the curriculum and, you know, there's a matter of equity and, and we can't have students use tech or, you know, here we're still fighting with uh, cell phone prohibition sometimes in, in classrooms. So I, I think that there's an interesting way um, if you go the way of information literacy um, as a necessity, you know. Yeah, and it's so true. I mean, these systems are everywhere. They're behind, you know, they're behind so many different things that we interact with on the internet. Um, so I, I love, I love that point. I think was it was it Katrina or did somebody else have have something they were going to say earlier? Um, I did have a question. Um... I, I was just curious, since you said your colleague Sarah couldn't join you, if there was anything more you wanted to say about the role of the school library, or if anyone else on the call who's done this in a library specific space, or been told to do this in their school library, if anyone has any input on that. I've been doing workshops for librarians, um, if that helps. Um, I think there's so many exciting applications and I think we need to position it as um, another emerging literacy um, under the, I'm not sure which is the umbrella and which are the things that go underneath it, but AI literacy is a thing. I've got some slides on it if anybody wants to see it. Um, but there, there's- I actually so was lucky enough to see your boss PD, professional development boss uh, well, presentation. So I, <laughs> the slides are great. <laughs> Everyone should get them from you, definitely. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of thinking that thinking that has to go on relating to what is appropriate for what type of assessment. And there are so many thoughtful ways students can use it for brainstorming, um, for developing vocabulary in an area that is new to them, 
for creating um, an analogy. Just there's there's so much that is possible. And then I think at the assessment level, and I've seen these models where they have green, yellow, red, what's appropriate for which assessment? To what degree should it be bot written or bot created? Or to what degree is human creativity essential in this particular task? Um, to what degree do I use it for grammar? I mean, it's not, you know, it's not a binary yes or no. It's just, you know, if we're using it and we're modeling thoughtful use of it, I'm hoping that that's a way we can teach. And you know, I, I have been using it like crazy, but I also know that it's not always as helpful as I want, but I also know that things are getting better. The large language models, each of them is growing in new ways. Many of them now have access to the web. That's also an issue relating to equity because some of the the, more, the larger and more in, more encompassing large language models are are pay, uh, and so we, we want to be careful about that. Uh, but there are really, I mean, I can talk for hours and hours about how excited I am about the possibilities. But also, I'm you know I'm I, I have to hit the brake on some of these areas where you know I do have serious concerns about bias and equity. Um, but I'll put the slide links and the, the, there's a petting zoo and a slide link. I haven't had time to present here, but I'd love to it when my life changes a little bit more. This is the petting zoo and the slides are on the top right corner. And you'll see towards the end, there's those models of um, how to have conversations about what, what do we value in terms of, of student create, creativity right now? And how do we have new conversations about academic honesty? Because we don't, as librarians and educators, we don't want to be in a gotcha stance. We want to be able to lead thoughtfully and not be punitive. Well, so I can share two okay. examples that, um, so I, I'm the upper school librarian at our school, and both of them are, I'll just, I can just be very brief with them because they are ones that teachers have agreed for me to come in and do but haven't done yet so I don't have much more to say about how successful they are um, but one is with an English class um, and so the um, I'm going to be doing it's more of like a digital humanities kind of like mini day with them so we'll be putting in um, so in particular for that class we're going to be using um, Jane Austen. And so the tool we're using is Voyant, um, and it already has Austin's um, corpus in there. Um, but you can put any corpus that you can get text access or a PDF or URL to. I mean, it's, it's a really wonderful tool. Um, but it's a great example for the garbage in, garbage out um, piece of things, uh, which is where I'm going to sort of draw out the AI piece because it's using these language models and it's pulling, you know, it's showing a lot of really cool stuff and it's looking at correlations of words. And so we can talk through how they use it to analyze a text and think about distance reading versus close reading. Um, but then I can make that jump for them to show them like, this is how these AI models are also being used. Uh, and one of the things that that tool does is it'll, um, you can have it show like a map of all of the places that show up within it. And the cool thing with the Austin ones is that when you do that, it shows all these big circles for the places um, in all the wrong spots, right? Because the tool is biased to the US. So when you put it in, it pulls up London in like some, you know, like London, Massachusetts or something, right? So you have to go back in and train it and tell it, no, I mean London, UK. And so you can fix the data, but it's a great way to very visually and quickly show the students like data is biased, right? Like this is biased to the US instead of to the UK. And so it's got all this stuff that's totally wrong, but you can fix it and, and think critically about it. Um, and then the other one I'm doing is actually um, in our advanced photo class. So I'm going to talk to them about um, copyright and fair use um, and thinking about themselves as creators. So we're going to look at like Creative Commons licenses and things like that. But it's going to be a great springboard for thinking about some of these questions like um, like Joe mentioned with using um, like generative art AI and things like that. So we're going to have that's going to be mostly the discussion as we're thinking about those sort of legal considerations and themselves as creators, what, what they would and wouldn't want out there. Um, so those are the two of the ways that I'm finding to kind of stick it into pre-existing curriculum so far. I have another example. Um, 
I borrowed actually heavily from Sarah Kelly Moody. Um, I'm a librarian in Honolulu. Um, we actually used AI with, um, we used ChatGPT with our, our IB Extended Essay students in how to choose a topic. Um, and going exactly back to what Joe mentioned earlier about um, talking about prompting. And so we had our students prompt, um, uh, build me a, a table of contents for a textbook about and if you put in coral bleaching, you get uh, one of the big difficulties that uh, the big wicked question for new researchers trying to learn something new is entry points and keyword search keywords to search on. And when we we were able to give our kids and work with our kids on that, um, it gave them it gives them fantastic outlines of keywords to use that they can then search in databases and um, we combined that with our um, ed technologists came and we talked about the um, training models and the data sets and the limits of data sets um, how that might be um, how the limits of the data set mean that it can't write your extended essay for you so um, and we also had our students um, one of the things we did was also pulled up, um, Sarah Kelly Moody had a AISL Associate Independent School Librarian blog post about bias in AI. And so um, we worked with AI, the kids took to it very quickly and started iterating very, very quickly um, on their prompts. And then what happened was we talked about, well, it's giving you great stuff, but let's talk about bias. And we pulled up her blog post and it's just pictures of um, that visually show when you, when you prompt a canvas AI for a Canva AI for um, a black librarian. It's very gender biased and you get all pictures of male black librarians. And we pulled that up, put it on the screen. And it's really interesting because with our, our IB extended essay group cohort, um, all of the girls in the group immediately saw what the bias is and about half of the boys did. And a lot of the boys were like, wait, what? <laughs> um, but it was a very fast visual way to show um, bias in the training set and how AI can, can be biased, will be biased and reflect the biases of our society as a whole um, and the internet as a whole. And, um, and what we did then is started to talk about, well, it's not just in pictures, so what are the things that we have to be careful or think about, aware of, as we are looking at print references? Um, the kids also, we asked the kids to draw what they, where they thought, draw a picture, a graphic of the internet. And we draw this graphic for them that has the internet and then there's email and there's the World Wide Web and then there are databases. And where does chat GPT or large language models or generative AI fit? And it's really interesting, the kids said, it's kind of like Google because it's kind of like the World Wide Web. It's scraping the same data set, but um, but you don't know where it's coming from. So they decided that it should be a separate bubble of its own, which was really interesting to me. And for me, in terms of platform awareness and understanding the tool, that I, I took that as a win. I was really happy about where, where we ended up with their, in terms of their thinking. But um, that's worked. That I, I felt like that was a really successful implementation for us. And borrowed heavily from Sarah. I think I got the prompt from Sarah. Everything is from Sarah. Sa Sarah is great. I'm I'm very sad <laughs> she wasn't here today. She's she's had a ton of good ideas around this. All right, taking this beat as a chance. I know these conversations could go on for a lot longer. But Joe, any final remarks as we close out? Um, no, I just want to say thanks for, for everybody for the discussion. I heard I learned some new things and some new resources here today that that maybe we'll try to incorporate in the future versions of Beaver 101. So, um, yeah, I appreciate everybody coming, coming and listening and sharing. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you to Joe, our great presenter. And thanks for being online with us today, everyone. The next session will be in later November. And if you'd like any of the links or topics that came up today, just feel free to reach out. And this recording will also be online very soon as well. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day wherever you are.